to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. My cohorts have a chance to read the meeting minutes and make any changes with comma? We have, and I would make a motion to approve the minutes from January 3rd. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Grants and I. Because there's no discussion. All right, and why don't we um, come back to the uh, disbursement of scholarship funds, because Stephen is here, and Stephen has a... Uh, proposal for not a proposal but update. my work my work program for the upcoming year yeah do you want me to pull up your chair or do you want me to speak from the podium from the podium you're on TV buckle okay everybody's watching I'm listening with bated breath so as is my practice I'm Steve Wallace your town planner by the way um, as is my uh, practice I like to start every year by reviewing my proposed work program with you folks, uh, just to let you know what I'll be working on. Did you all get a copy of my work program in your meeting minutes? Yes. Comma is very efficient. Okay. I don't know that you got one. Is there anything you're interested in, Becky? No, I will just listen to you. Okay, very well. <laughs> well, then put your phone down. <laughs> Unless you're recording this no. presentation. So I'm going to try to keep it brief, but there are some things that I need to explain, so bear with me here. First item on the work program is update the town's floodplain zoning bylaw to state standards to go along with the new flood rate insurance maps that are currently being prepared by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Your current set of uh, flood maps were prepared in the early 80s. And FEMA and the Massachusetts counterpart have been spending the last five years updating the flood maps in this area they were supposed to be released last month, uh, but we got the word that they will not be released until December 2024. I've got the bylaw all prepared. It's been reviewed and approved by the state and by town council. We just need to adopt the bylaw at the same time as the new map. <coughs> so that will be for the 2025 town meeting. Any questions on that one? Moving right along. Um, I will continue to work with the planning board to prepare a new multifamily housing overlay district that will help Sterling comply with the state's no, new zoning requirement for MBTA communities. The state considers Sterling to be an MBTA adjacent community because we abut Lemonster. Even though their train station is in North Lemonster and far away from Sterling. Just the same, we've got, uh, we got swept up in this new law and they are requiring MBTA communities and adjacent communities to zone for multi-family housing by right as opposed to special permit. You're clear on the difference between the two. <coughs> okay, uh, and it has to be at a density of 15 units per acre. Now how do you do that in a town like Sterling that does not have municipal sewer? Well, in our case, we propose to rezone the area around the Northgate apartment complexes as our MBTA uh, multifamily overlay district. Multifamily housing is already being built there. It's to the density required by the state. 
and it's the only part of town that has access to municipal sewer. Leominster has a sewer line going up Research Drive, and that's what's serving the Northgate apartment houses. So we put together a bylaw and a map depicting that area, and we shipped it off to the state in October. Um, unfortunately, there were some flaws in our parcel data, and we also needed to make some adjustments to the dimensional standards in the bylaw. Uh, the parcel data has been corrected, so is the bylaw, and it was shipped to the state early this month. I just talked to the gentleman who's reviewing all of these proposals for the various towns that it affects. Uh, he swamped. It's probably going to be a couple months before they get back to us with their feedback. So long story short, we're not going to have this for the upcoming annual town meeting. Uh, the 2025 town meeting is a more realistic end date. Stephen, on this, so we take it to town meeting. What happens if the voters say, ah, 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 ah? State will deem you in noncompliance, and we will no longer be eligible for a variety of state grants, particularly infrastructure grants. Now, I'm I think that's important for us to put out there. And that is absolutely important, and I was going to uh, raise it myself. Infrastructure projects are very expensive, and small towns like ours typically receive grants to help us fund such projects. Um, we're going, once we have a design ready for the Village Center, we're going to go for the construction funds. That's considered an infrastructure project. So if we want to remain eligible for that grant, we need to have this bylaw on the books. I've tried to make it as painless as possible for the town, designated an area where this housing is already being built and where it makes practical sense. We could put together uh, a district and a bylaw out in the middle of nowhere where it would just be a district on paper and that doesn't serve anyone's interest. So I'm hopeful that the state will approve our current area and the bylaw, I will certainly keep you folks posted along the way. Also, um, we need to understand that it doesn't mean that this is going to be built out. No, it, it's not a requirement that it gets built there. It's just adding one more option, uh, one more permitted use in the affected area. Any other questions before I move on? There's an overlay. Does Northgate help you qualify then? Uh, yes, it does. It does. So that meets the requirements for the high density housing? That it's the at the density the state requires, 15 okay. units per acre. Okay. Did they change that? Because I thought before any existing units did not count towards the number we needed to well, provide it's that. not like we have to provide the units. It's just allowing them to be built in, in a specific area. So even though those units are built and are being built, it's not like we can say, there's our units, we're done. Yeah. But didn't they specify how many units? We, yeah, we have, to have enough, we have to have enough land area for 156 units. So uh, we, the, we, what they've designated right. around North There's right. a very detailed compliance model that the state makes us run to see how many units can be put in that area. Right. But Northgate doesn't count towards those no, units. It's no. Right. Okay. No. All right. On to item number three, which is going to be the bulk of my work program this year. Um, I think anybody who's worked with your zoning bylaw understands that it's out of date, in need of modernization, and needs to be a bit easier to read and understand. Uh, that certainly was a recommendation made loud and clear in your master plan. 
Um, while you can pay a professional zoning consultant $150,000 in the ballpark to do the whole thing at once, I proposed last year that we do the job in-house. Uh, but if we're going to do it in-house, we need to break it into manageable pieces. So the planning board and I have come up with the following <coughs> schedule. This calendar year, we're going to work on the industrial and commercial aspects of your zoning bylaw, getting those modernized and updated um, into your zoning bylaw. And we will bring those to the 2025 town meeting. Next year, 2025, we will spend that calendar year working on the residential components of your zoning bylaw, getting those into shape, bringing those to the 2026 town meeting. And then in 2026, we will handle what's left over. The sign bylaw, the parking bylaw, uh, non-conforming uses, whatever's left. We'll get those in shape for the 2027 town meeting. After that, I retire, go on my merry way, and your new planner has an up-to-date, modernized zoning bylaw to work with. Now, so that's the schedule that we would like to pursue. Um, it would make it a lot easier on us and this whole effort if the other boards in town accepted the schedule and respected it and not submit zoning amendments out of turn, like the zoning board's amendments to the multifamily zoning district which are ill-conceived, reactionary, and short-sighted. We're in the middle of a housing crisis. Why are we making multifamily housing more expensive and harder to do? Um, the planning board does not support that zoning amendment, and if it does make it to town meeting, which we hope it doesn't, we'll be speaking against it. Um, I would hope that the zoning board would reconsider this, their zoning amendment on multifamily housing, and wait until 2025 when we take up residential zoning across the board and work with us to come up with something that we can both support. Um, towns have better success when their land use boards pull in the same direction instead of working at cross purposes like ours are. Um, I also think that we need to have a, uh, a better established process for sponsoring zoning amendments. I reviewed the town meeting minutes for the last 50 years, and what I saw was a trail of failed zoning amendments. That tells me you're not doing it right. For zoning amendments, the ideal way to do it is to draft the amendments and then go around to all the other boards, commissions, and committees and explain what you're doing and why. Don't expect them to come to your meeting. You go to theirs as a sign of courtesy and respect and get their input face to face. Then you have a couple of public forums to explain to the public what you're doing and why you're doing it. That way, you know what the people's concerns are and you address them before the zoning amendment gets to town meeting. By the time town meeting comes around, you want everybody to know about what you're doing zoning-wise and be in support of it. The worst thing you can do is put together a zoning amendment on the fly, not talk to the other boards, commissions, and committees, not hold any public forums, and then it gets to town meeting and it's a surprise to the attendees. In that case, all you need is a couple people to speak against it and it's going to go down the tubes. We've also got to get out of the bad habit of amending or altering a zoning bylaw amendment on the town meeting floor. That's absurd. That's not how you do it. It's confusing for the attendees and it makes the zoning amendment sponsor look like they don't know what they're doing. 
So we've got to get out of those bad habits. I've talked with the town administrator, and we would like to convene uh, an all-boards meeting at some point in the near future so that we can all get on the same page with a zoning amendment schedule and a process. Um, but that meeting has to start with an acknowledgement that the way you've been doing it isn't working and you need to change. So there's my sermon on zoning amendments. Let me get back to my work program here. Do you have a, a, a time that you would like to do this all board? We used to have all board meetings every year, basically. Do you um, have time on that? or? We were thinking sometime in April or May after town meeting. After town meeting? A little late now in terms of... Uh, Four the, or seven. <laughs> and for this, we're talking land use boards. Yes, we're, we're talking zoning. Oh, and right. you guys are involved in the process, so we'd want you there, too. Okay. Busy that night. How about you? I'll be there. Oh, fine. Kristen's going. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen. So you don't have anything until after town meeting? Well, we, we're willing to hold it in April. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're open to suggestion. Okay. Uh, so as I said, this year we're going to work on the commercial and industrial and economic development aspects of the zoning bylaw. And we're going to start with a couple public forums in March. On March 6th, we are going to have a public forum aimed at finding out what people want to see in the performance zone for economic development. It's going to be held March 6th over in the Old Town Hall at 6.30, and then the program is going to be repeated again on Saturday, March 9th in the morning. That way, if you can't make the night meeting, you can go to the Saturday morning meeting. You can't make the Saturday morning meeting, you go to the night meeting. Um, we're focusing on the performance zone because it's been vastly underutilized and it represents the town's best and immediate opportunity for economic development. You've still got about 25 to 30 acres of developable land out there. Uh, it's right near the intersection uh, with 190. Um, so we, we think that's our best opportunity for new economic development sooner rather than later. Certainly we know that once they finish hauling earth material out of the pits along Route 12 across from Yola's, you'll have a flat area for a nice industrial park, but that's 15, 20 years down the road. So. We're going to hold our forums in March and hear what the people want for economic development and the performance zone. Uh, we hope it will inform the planning board's discussions on expanding and modernizing the commercial and industrial uses in your zoning bylaws table of uses. Uh, we also want to move the special permit granting authority for commercial and industrial uses from the zoning board to the planning board. It's not very business friendly to put a new business that wants to come to Sterling through what could be a six to eight month permitting process. They go to the zoning board, they spend two to three to four months getting their special permit, and then they come to the planning board for site plan review, spend two to three months with us. Uh, and, and two sets of fees. And two sets of fees. And what happens if the conditions imposed by the zoning board conflict with the conditions imposed by the planning board? It makes much more sense to have the special, <clears throat> to have the planning board be the special permitting granting authority for commercial and industrial development. They can do it at the same time as they handle the site plan. That's how grown-up towns handle their business. That is my recommendation for Sterling. Um, 
We also want to uh, look at deleting residential development as a permitted use in the commercial district. Most towns don't allow residential development in their commercial districts. Of all of your parcels that are commercially zoned, 43% of them are used residentially. So you're eating up your available commercial land with residential development. So we would like to tackle that issue as part of our work program this year. And lastly, do away with the 15 pages of regulations that govern the performance district. Uh, those 15 pages of regulations are contradictory, confusing, they read like a Kafka novel. If I can't understand them, if your building commissioner can't understand them, how are we going to advise people how to use them? In their stead, we are proposing that we put together a set of site plan regulations that the planning board will use for uh, site plans wherever they are. You've already given the planning board the authority to adopt site plan regulations. It's in your zoning bylaw. And most towns, their planning boards follow through with a set of regulations that articulate uh, their design standards for parking, landscaping, lighting, all of the other things that get looked at during the site plan review process. Uh, right now, a developer, they put together what they would like and they hope that the planning board will buy it. Developers will tell you that they're more than willing to comply with your design standards if they know what they are. So by having a set of site plan regulations that articulate your design standards and have it apply to all of commercial and industrial and the large scale residential developments throughout town no matter where they are, that makes, that makes much more sense than having 15 pages of regulations for one underutilized overlay district, the performance zone. You with me? Got it. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Um, next, I'm going to continue working with the Economic Development Committee on two projects, their Wayfaring Signage Project and the Village Center Building Facade Improvement Program. Uh, item six, I'm gonna continue working with the Open Space Committee on trail planning. And they've recently approached me for some help on a mapping project, uh, mapping various environmental resources on top of all of the uh, properties enrolled in the Chapter 61 program. And then they're gonna work with the North County Land Trust to do some outreach to these property owners and let them know that they have other options for the ultimate disposition of their property other than selling it to a developer. Who's doing that? The Open Space Committee. Uh, seven, continue to assist the town administrator with uh, handling earth removal permits. Eight, continue my search for available land for a senior housing project. Nine, continue to manage the planning board caseload on a day-to-day -day basis. Ten, continue to participate in the regional planning commission's various uh, steering committees. Eleven, continue to search out grant opportunities for the town. Uh, I recently worked with DPW on um, a statement of interest for um, uh, the MVP grant, municipal which stands municipal vulnerability. Uh, thank you, program. thank you. So we had talked about the couple of culverts and, and some of the damage that had happened um, to the September storms. And lastly, continue to advocate for the town's interests at all the state and regional meetings I attend. So that's my work program for 2024. Ta-da! Ta-da! <laughs> Questions, right. comments? Kristen? Just 
Thank you. I hope that everyone watching or who may watch later really listens and understands the importance of what you're doing along with the planning board, um, how important it's going to be to be paying attention in the next couple of years to what you're undertaking, and definitely make sure you come out and support Stephen and the planning board and your town on March 6th and 9th. So thank you for everything you've put together. David? I echo that statement. This is a, it's quite a monumental uh, task you're taking on with getting this put together. So thank you for, for doing that for the town. Sure. Okay, um, I just have one question, Stephen. You had, uh, you actually skipped over number three. I did. Yeah. Oh, right. Uh, that's the only zoning amendment that we're bringing to the 2024, the upcoming town meeting. And that is adding the various types of kennels to the zoning bylaw table of uses. You added them to your definition section a couple years ago. You didn't add them to the table of uses. So um, we want to tackle that. That's, it's, I would consider that a minor zoning amendment in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. But well, I just wanted you to clarify that. Yeah, for certainly. For everybody. And then, um, so really this year for the town meeting, you're not really bringing anything other than that? The kennel one and, you know, if the Zoning Board's multifamily proposal makes it to town meeting. We'll be speaking against it. Yes, but you would like that to be held off until yes, I would. residential. Okay. That would be my so hopefully we get everybody on the same page and they work together. On a schedule and a process. Yeah. Um, and then, so nothing with the performance zone this year? No. Uh, and I think, too, the, the important part of all of what you're doing is um, the economic development potential. You know, everybody just <coughs> tax bills and, you know, cry in the blues, which I understand. I did my own. Do a whole box of tissues. But um, that's really where, where we need to head is some economic development in town. And no, we can't wait to, for to slow years. the growth rate of uh, your single family tax bills. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's how you do it. All right. Um, Bill, any questions? Nothing for me. Okay. Joe? On the performance zone dialogue that you had, Steve, thanks for that. Um, is that 15 pages versus the site plan regulations? Is the 15 pages scaring away any prospects right now? I'm, I'm digging into if we do all of this, is it going to have an effect on drawing people in? Well, I would say that it has because you, that area is very underutilized. I, I think it's underutilized primarily because we made attempts at rezoning that recently at, at the two town meetings that I've been at recently and we failed in both of those. Well, the uh, zoning is definitely a deterrence. Yeah. Because you can't figure out what can or can't go in there. But right, we on the planning board had people come to us and if we couldn't figure it, I don't know if you've ever read it, you should read it just for fun. Because I read it multiple times and it's still it's confusing. I would read it right <laughs> around bedtime, my suggestion. Um, I don't know how you folks went about trying to rezone the performance zone last time. I don't know how strong of a case you folks made for economic development in that area and why it's important and how it impacts your tax bill. Um, I would like to give it a try. Um, I'm going to employ, employ a bottoms-up planning approach, whereas I show them what's allowed there now. I show them what other towns our size allow for commercial and development. And the folks are going to tell me, through a dot preference exercise, what their preferences are for that district. They're going to tell me. I'm not going to tell them. I don't live here. Um, I'm just your town planner. They're going to give me their marching orders for what they want to see for economic development. And after I've made my case for economic development, if they tell me, 
yeah, Steve, yeah, you, you made a solid case, but we're not buying it. We'd like it to be rural farmland. Well, so be it. But um, I'd like a shot at making my case to the public. I'd like to hear what they have to say, and then we'll go from there. Well, well that area that is of interest to you is on um, performance. And the, the things you said uh, led me to believe that we're eliminating the 15 pages and we're going to have uh, site plan requirements replace that, which yes, is yes. more crystal clear. But it stays a performance zone. But we don't know that yet. Okay. Because that the two attempts in the past was to try and get that change from performance to something else. Right. Like and one commercial. of the biggest drawbacks was the uh, existing cemetery. Exactly. Some people got scared that we were going to interfere with that. Uh, no, and I that's a hang up. We can take that parcel right out of the right. equation. And I think that's what we didn't do um, at those two town meetings. You know, we're still going to be there and when you say take it out we mean it stays as is we're not going near it and it'll be fine every we're not cemetery you have in town has a uh, zoning on top of it yeah and it's the, the cemetery right out here the land it's on is zoned um residential it's not like anyone's gonna dig it up and build houses on it uh, cemeteries are permanently protected End of story, period. No matter what district they're in. For the record. Well, for the record, that probably wasn't made clear enough at the town meeting at the time. And besides those town meetings, we're the ones that were outside, so it was kind of difficult for discussion in general. But well, that's why you do your advance work and have everybody <clears throat> understand what you're doing well before you bring it to town meeting. All right, well, thank you very much, Stephen, and uh, hopefully we will get everybody to work together on all of these points, actually. Okay, thank you for your time. Appreciate what you're doing. Okay. And then, Richard, I didn't see you sneak in. I must have fallen sneak. asleep. <laughs> Did you come up through the window? Where are my sneakers? Oh, that's it. That's <laughs> it. Did you want to stay for the whole meeting, or do you want to see me move you up to see what it is you'd like to address. I'll wait till public session. Well, we're not having that. <coughs> <laughs> we'll see you in two weeks. All right, so then we're going to uh, go right back to um, deciding on the disbursements for the um, scholarship funding. And I'll be honest, I usually look to Kama to make some suggestions on this. Um, she seems to know where the money is. However, it's all written out there. So last year we gave out two $500 scholarships. Um, and I think we actually had <clears throat> more people last year uh, come forward and apply for them. So this is the money we have. Uh, and we get to decide how much you want to give out this year and from what accounts it comes from. So we have uh, the Fanning Scholarship Fund right now is at $316. The Buttrick is at $786. We have $1,200 in the uh, Conant. Yakabuchi has $1,000. And the Houghton has $2,700. So you can decide on how many scholarships you want to give out this year, how much for each one, and where you want the money to come from. Any suggestions? <clears throat> and then there was silence. <laughs> <laughs> so these, if we take money out of these, they're continuing to add interest. to it. This is right. Interest. So that's, we're that's so okay. just okay. Yes. And which ones did we give out last year? Any from here? I, I think last year um, we took it out of, for some reason, do you remember, Joe, which account we took it out of? I don't. For some reason, I think it was Houghton. Houghton's always had the mo more money in there than, than the others. We kind of ate up the others over the years. But you can decide on a total and then take a little bit from each one. I mean, you have 
the Conant has 12, Houghton has 27, you got another 1,000 in Yakabuchi. So you could do three, take $500 out of each one of those, or take 200 bucks out of the $1,000 ones and 500 whatever. You can do whatever. And, and anything? Any ideas? Can they be different amounts? Can we do like two 500 and one 1,000? We, we wouldn't do more 1,000. We, we wouldn't have enough money for no. that. No. We have this money here. Yeah, but you don't want to deplete any of those. So it wouldn't be depleted if you took it from the one with almost with twenty seven hundred. Well, I know, and I probably know where you're coming from because you have college age children, <laughs> as and as do I. And five hundred dollars <throat> is like a drop in the bucket. However, it's the drop in the bucket we can give them. We used to only do. I, I don't remember. We've done 200 for several students. We did uh, <coughs> 250 at one point. We do it every year. There should be at least 500. So I would say we should take from Houghton because there's plenty there. Seven is not plenty, but okay. <laughs> you just don't want to give anybody anything. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very conservative. <laughs> No, I no. You can take so you're no, taking we'll five. Or we can just do two from Houghton, and then it'll end up being right on par with what we've got left for the. Could do that too. Two five hundred dollar ones. What do you want to do, David? Um, Throw in your own cash. Yeah, if that's what you want. Give them a dump truck, whatever. <laughs> so if you want to keep these ones accruing interest, and there's plenty in there, if we take two from two five hundred from Houghton, then we're leaving enough money in all of these to continue accruing interest. Or so, you could totally wipe out. Fanning and Buttrick. And you could do that too. Close those two accounts. Because there's no outside money coming into those, is there? It's just no, no, strictly it's just interest. interest. So, just interest. you know, I don't know how much interest you're getting on 326 or 736. So, do we could do 3500. Two from Houghton, one from Buttrick. Then for the next year, that's going to leave about 500 from the Fanning and Buttrick to be one full scholarship for the next year. And then they'll be closed out next year. It's always earning yeah, interest. interest. Going to be closed out. Yeah, it's right. always yeah. earning interest. Yeah. There's, right. there's, other mo there's unexpendable money that's not being, that's how we earn the interest. All right, so you're talking about giving out three five hundred dollar ones. Let's see why not. Man. David, but that's just my opinion. It's I mean, it's <coughs> just two, three is fine. We're well, just looking at the notes here that um, we've had lack of participation really over the last few years. Do you think we get we would get participation? or interest at the $500 mark, or should we make this one at 1000 What do you think, Joe? Joe is on the scholarship well, I, I, re I recall I asked you at every meeting, did we have any applicants on this last year? Pretty and, sure then, and, the and then at the last minute. The last day. Did, yeah, it all came in. So we had multiple applicants for it. We had but they arrived last year, late. One was ineligible and one wasn't in town or something like that. So yes. they moved. But everything arrived late for some reason or like the last couple days. So yeah. let me ask you this if we say we're gonna appropriate a thousand dollars to five hundred and when we get one applicant, can we give that individual the thousand dollars? Make that as part of your motion. If you're gonna appropriate the money, you can make that call. Do that. And where is it coming from? Two hundred from each one. Two hundred. Oh, That's five. from all five of them. Could do that too. Huh? 
lest we forget that each of these scholarship trust funds has a specific hoops you have to jump through, right? So I'm just saying that if you do all five of them, it makes it more difficult for the kids to apply for these because some of them want X, Y, and Z and others want. So if you're doing it all in one, it's going to make it even more difficult to apply. So we should just pick two of the accounts. Or even one. If you're going to do a thousand dollars, we'll take two, out of the Maria Houghton, take the thousand dollars. Right, and then split that into two scholarships. If only if we don't have people applying for them, then yes, we can move over to to give the thousand dollars away. That's a nice motion you made. <laughs> Phil, can I see you outside? I'll take you down like nobody's business. Okay, so I would make a motion that we take a thousand dollars out of Mary Houghton, Maria Houghton. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, to award two five hundred dollars scholarships <coughs> with the stipulation if we don't have applicants we will give out the full thousand to one student. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Yeah. Aye. Aye. and I. Thank you. All right. So next on our agenda is the uh, permit. <coughs> for um, entrance on a public way, and it's up on 166 Justice Hill Road, and the applicant is Irving Deedle. It's been signed off by each of the boards. And fire, public works, building, <coughs> planning, Conservation. And Public Works did make a note that there will have to be a pipe required under the driveway. Make a motion to approve the permit for entrance to Public Way at 166 Justice Hill with the conditions stated by the Department of Public Works with the pipe under the driveway. Second it. Uh, discussion? You and I. Sure. Grants and I. And then the non union COLA. Bill, you want to talk to us about that? Yep. Um, currently, you have the three um, union contracts settled. Uh, the police was done two years ago and everything else was done last year. John and David, uh, each of them are settled at 3%. Um, so my recommendation would be to match that for the non-union folks. Um, I believe a town-wide COLA for this fiscal year was about 200000 off the top of my head. Um, so it would be a little bit more because it's on a higher base. but. Um, You look like you have a question. Thank you. Oh, okay. Any questions? Nope. <coughs> I shall abstain from that discussion. Oh. Okay, fine. All right, so you want us to um, take a vote on going along with the non union COLA? Do we, we do, Traditional, well, we don't. Traditionally, you have been the same across all the unions and the non-union folks, so. Right. Okay, so I don't know why that would change. Well, it just needs the vote. Oh, all right. Well, I would make a motion that we approve the non-union COLA to coincide with all the other uh, unions. Seconded. Contracts. Uh, further discussion? Fine. Yeah. All those in favor? Krantz and I. <laughs> Oh, you're going to wreck it anyway, Joe, so. Is that reflective in the omnibus budget that we're reviewing yep. tomorrow night, though? Mm -hmm. It is. Okay. Um, so, uh, 
as you know, we went to town meeting uh, and there was a request for an audit for the uh, Board of Health. So um, what I have in front of you is uh, a request for a proposal. Um, pretty much mirrors the actual article from the town meeting for the audit. Richard, did you see this at all? I didn't, no. Um, all right, so the people on the audit committee, George Han Handy, Dan, Dan Donovan, and myself, and um, this is what came out of our meeting, basically. Did you see this, Joe? Mm -hmm. see uh, I have not. Which already got mine. You can have it. It's a it's a pretty pretty simple uh, proposal. And uh, but I was, I had given you the uh, all the audit right. on the state contract. But right. So what um, George and Dan uh, and I decided is we would put that out because it's ten thousand dollars or less. Hopefully, would be nice. Um, but we would put it out to two companies that are part of the Mass um, <coughs> Association Independent Study. Does that fit what you had in mind, Richard, when they all came into town meeting? It, it, looks, it looks to me what can be done with the money that's available. And I think that's what that, that's the goal. Was, and we I didn't want to put in what we actually voted for, see if they'll come in, you know, maybe they're dumb and we'll look at the town meeting and see that we voted ten thousand well, and I see what they can do. People. Huh? <laughs> we don't want any dumb people, so man. I just meant in that respect. <laughs> like they know better than to go back to a town meeting and watch the whole thing. So uh, uh, with that I would entertain a motion that we move this request. <coughs> For a proposal forward, um, and and what it says is it will be we will send it out. So we'll take proposals from January thirty first up until March first. That gives them a month. Okay, so moved. Seconded. Okay. Fine. <coughs> Fine. All right, and then uh, we have the town administrator's report. Sure. Uh, attached is a letter uh, from Tom Brown, the superintendent at Monty Tech. Um, you may or may not want to take any action on it. There is some proposed legislation which would create a blind lottery uh, for tech schools across the state. Um, I tend to agree it is tough to budget in that. Um, we wouldn't know the exact number of students every year that we would be budgeting for like we currently do. We know we have 20 seats or 25 seats, whatever the number is, um, so we can budget for that. Um, the current bills look to do a blind lottery so that number can fluctuate significantly. Obviously, somewhere like Fitchburg, where the majority of students are coming from, would have a you know potential bigger impact. Um, it would also reduce um, or eliminate any um, entry requirements so that anybody um, can go to those rather than having to meet certain certain requirements. Um, so looking at it on the budget side, I tend to agree if we just have our 25 spots or whatever the number is per year, um, that's great. Uh, if they eliminated the, you know, eligibility requirements, that's, you know, not my major concern. Um, just trying to consistently budget a number um, is, the, is the part that I get nervous about. Okay, so you want us to take a um, a vote on this? How we want to go, or you, you just can choose what action you want to or not want to take. Um, I have not spoken to our school committee rep, uh, Mr. Broussard, yet, either. <coughs> I personally, because this is the first that we've seen this. Yeah, we just got it the other day. So I would personally like to look into it a little bit more before I take any action on it. Next agenda or something. Or whatever. How do you feel, Kristen? I have my opinion on it. I mean, I know from a town perspective and being able to budget is important, but I also think 
I would agree with the blind lottery because it gives every child an equal chance. And so from that perspective, I think that the blind lottery, given some background that I know about this situation, I think that I think that's a better way to go about it for the students. But I understand for the town and finances, and it's important to everyone, but I don't know that more than our allotted amount would really end up, we're not gonna end up with all students coming from Sterling in a blind lottery. You know, so I don't, I don't. But a five student swing is a $100,000 swing, so. If we go up five from where we typically are, then that's that's true. A, that's a big dollar figure. Or the other side, you know, five kids less at roughly twenty thousand dollars in tuition is a big savings somewhere. Okay. Well, I would, I personally would like to move this to the next yeah. meeting just so that um, I can look into it. Yeah, we had already there. posted the agenda, so I just figured I'd bring that up so we can put it on another one. Yeah. Uh, okay, you brought it up. Now we're going to move it to the next meeting. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Uh, would you like me to see if uh, mm -hmm. either Mr. Broussard or someone from the district could attend? Or? That'd be interesting. Sometimes it's difficult for him to to attend. Yeah, if you wanted to invite him, that's fine <coughs> too. Um, I'll make a few calls myself. All right. So and now we have Bill's administrator report. Yeah, so that was the first thing. Uh, obviously, there were some governor's cuts in the, uh, or the governor's 9C cuts. Most of it came from the Mass Health Trust or Mass Health funding. Uh, one of the things that did affect us, and there were very few that affected towns and or the school districts, uh, was some of the earmarks. Our Mass Office of Transportation and Tourism earmark that we received for some of the signage. Uh, was reduced by 50% from 25,000 down to 12,500. Um, you know, we can get by with, with that for now. Um, I think the primary focus for that was getting the sign on Route 12, uh, Welcome to Sterling sign on the West Boylston line, and also eventually out on 140 if we can find a suitable spot that's not uh, in the way or in the DOT right away. Yeah. So I think for the, the funds that we do have in hand, we can get that done. Obviously, the second part of that would have been wayfinding signage for the, the remainder of town and the downtown as we get that project up and running, hopefully. Uh, you saw the chamber press release for the uh, Welcome to Sterling sign. I sent that along. Also, Stephen and I attended the chamber uh, breakfast Saturday. The lieutenant governor was uh, the primary speaker along with uh, Mark Doan of Newview Communities was working on a project for affordable housing in Fitchburg. Uh, the MMA conference is um, starting this week, so there is an attached letter if, since no one else is going, uh, to allow me to be the voting member for Sterling on the couple of recommendations that they have, which I don't remember off the top of my head. And then still working on the shared services. Um, it's looking at this point, since I haven't got a uh, Good answer that will post the conservation position as it has been part-time and perhaps change it down the road. Um, still looking to see, you know, if we can look at a bigger shared service uh, district for a building commissioner and potential local commissioner um, to give us a little succession planning and um, greater services on both the, the building and zoning sides. Um, we did have the kickoff meeting for the field study. For recreation with um, Activitas is the vendor that we used. Uh, so we met with them last week, beginning of this week. I don't know what day it was at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we met with them. They'll be coming out for a site visit and taking the soil sample soon and getting that master planning work together. And obviously we'll be sharing that out with you folks in the Recreation Commission as we get that information. Um, we do have the complete or a current complete set of preliminary plans for the underground stormwater and, and water in the downtown district. Uh, we did have to do some coordination with uh, MassDOT since the, this part of 62 obviously is theirs in that last crosswalk to see if that would affect any of the work that we plan on doing. Um, fortunately, it's not really going to affect much. 
Um, our engineers have also done the water modeling to, to prove that we can use one water main through the downtown. There's two, so I'm guessing that when they extended up Meeting House up to the Tuttle Road tank, they just installed another one rather than um, trying to co-locate those. So there's two in downtown. So they'll be able to use one. So that's been uh, added to the plans. And then we do have, um, eventually we'll have some concepts of the different curb layouts, uh, which I'll get to you folks and the DPW board and whoever else needs to get it. So I think those are the major items, unless there are any questions. Uh, I know the Finance Committee is, is meeting on some of the budget things. We don't know the school number yet. We'll get the range for insurance this weekend at the MMA conference. And usually by the end of this month, we typically get Worcester Retirement. We also have <coughs> some things. Um. Okay. Um, any questions, Kristen? Nope. <coughs> Answers? Nothing. David? None. Um, all right, I'm all set with that. Thank you. Um, just want to remind people, too, that about the voting and check the website, what's available, what's not, and papers are available for nominations for town boards. Um, and then on our next meeting, um, Bill, I'd like to have the Finance and the Capital Committee come in, um, go over some things with them. And then um, the other thing, too, one of the things I want to go over is that you, that the Finance Committee and the Capital Committee meet where it can be filmed so the general public can, um, I did mention it to George about having a meeting at the Senior Center, which of course I love, because anybody who uses it, the busier it is, looks good, um, but. We, we met there because the facilities facilitated us actively editing a spreadsheet on the big screen in the training classroom that they have there. Big enough? Need glasses? The room is set up for that. That's fine. And I understand that, except it's not really conducive for the general public to show up um, at something like that. It didn't say anything about training. It said, you know, it had a full agenda for you, all, for the Capital Committee. It was, I didn't see training in that. Yeah. But it was a public meeting. It was, it was posted. It was absolutely it. Dick yeah. Mackey was there. Yeah. It was the only public that showed up yeah. for our meeting. And, and you know, it doesn't matter if one person shows up or five people show up. At least it, it makes them feel as though they can show up. But that classroom is not really conducive for more than, you know, maybe 15 people. And there's a lot of you. There's a lot of you. So in general, we only usually get one at our meetings, all right? Maybe two. Recently, yes, two. we got three tonight. Yeah. Um, okay, so so anyway, just thought if we could have and, and go over. The some other stuff. thing I would I would bring up is we normally have our meeting on the night that the ZBA takes mm -hmm. this room, so we don't get filmed anyway. Well, we're or, gonna have to we're right. gonna have to work on that. The ZBA can you know really got to work on it. Either somebody changes their meeting night. Because what we're doing right now in budget season is important. Yeah. So we'll check the calendar and whatever we can do to, to make it right for everybody. Um, oh, I, I, I have no aversion to it. You like being on television, don't you? I love it. I, I figured. <laughs> I'm on TV. I was every surprised day not to see you at the Emmys the other night, to be honest with you. But, um, you didn't see me in the back? <laughs> He's just had a camera shot. <laughs> He's almost there. Okay, and then um, the other thing, too, for you all, we have a letter to the ZBA that we discussed at our last meeting. We voted on just look at that and see if there's any changes you want to make. And then we will now, Richard, open it up to public session. Richard? Yeah, well, no. No, 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 no. Public session, as you well know, and remember, is short and sweet. Okay. It, this is just I for my notes. <laughs> no, I, Richard Lane, um, I, 
I know it's not on the agenda, but I, I just want to take a few minutes to comment on council's response to my questions. Because clearly I'm disappointed, but not because of what he said, but because what I feel is a lack of diligence in answering the questions. So the council acknowledges that the chapter 111, section 31 lists two requirements when the Board of Health is enacting a regulation. First is the hearing, nobody has any questions on. Second was the statement of need. There's only two requirements, and he says one of them is de minimis, and that means it's too trivial to merit consideration. That's what it means legally. Now, how can one of the two be too trivial? And then he, uh, he references case law, but none of the cases that he cited or had elements that, re that required a, the, the, uh, where the statute was omitted, okay? What I'm trying to say, our board omitted required elements of the statute. None of the cases he cited involved that at all. Two of the cases incited health regulations, and, and in there, there's, I've actually read the cases, their statements of need were very specific, cited studies and everything else. So it has nothing to do with that. And the third references clerical errors for a planning board, very different than what we're looking at here. And completely ignored the case of Divine versus the Board of Health of Westport, where they failed to follow their regulations and the Superior Court overturned their ruling. That is directly uh, pertinent to what we're arguing. Um, also, in Council's opinion, directly contradicts the legal guidance provided in the legal handbook for the Massachusetts Boards of Health. That's what the, all this paper book, okay, this big thing. The legal handbook for the Massachusetts Boards of Health, which was published in 2021 by the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards, which states on page 54, note, the Board of Health must state at the hearing the local conditions which exist or reasons for exceeding such minimum requirements as found in Title V. Any failure to fulfill the requirements for hearings, publications, or notice to DEP will mean that if the regulation is challenged, it will be unenforceable. That's legal guidance from the entity that gives legal guidance to health boards. How, how this was overlooked by council, I have no idea. Council also misstates my question. I never asked in there concerning a board's authority to enact regulations, and he uses the term more stringent. It's not even the correct term. The correct term is, I'll find it, <laughs> um, exceed. The correct term is exceed, not more stringent. I, I readily acknowledge that the board can enact reasonable regulations which exceed Title V. I specifically ask if a board can contradict Title V. Never answered. Title V states that the deep observation hole is not required. I'll put the not required in quotes. Our current board has required it. That certainly seems to me that it contradicts the, the regulation. One regulation, our regulation contradicting the state regulation. Now some might say that that is, it's just semantics. Semantics is, the study of law <coughs> is semantics. It, law is all about semantics. I also think it's very interesting that council chose not to answer question five correctly. Right. Now I put that question in there and it's about when a transfer of title to a, a first degree family member. I put it in there because it uses the exact same verbiage as the the, the statute, the section of the regulation, rather, that we're talking about, the exact same verbiage. But by not answering it, he says, essentially, that a board could pass a law requiring a Title V inspection for a transfer of title to family. That's, that's what he says. I would tell you, no attorney that I've spoken to so far regarding this matter agrees that such a regulation would stand. And when I ask why, they say, because it contradicts the intent of Title V. And I'm saying that our regulation contradicts the intent of Title V. That was never answered. Now, 
you can tell that I'm disappointed. I don't, I don't think that any work was done on it. I think a, a, bunch of, a bunch of cases were thrown out, and when you read the cases, they don't even make sense to me. Okay? Now, the town's spent considerable money on this issue already. And I know you control the purse strings for council. So I'm not requesting that you spend any more. There's, there's no need for it. But with this in mind, I would ask that you consider one thing. That if there's a legal challenge mounted to this regulation, I would ask that you as a board consider not allowing our council to oppose the challenge. In this event, it would send a clear message to the voters and everyone else involved. I don't know if that uh, legal challenge is going to be mounted or not, but if it is, I would like you to consider staying mute, mute on the point. That would, that would allow the, the challenge to succeed. Lastly, in this respect, I found it very interesting that council chose to mention the one item <clears throat> on the Board of Health minutes from the hearing where they stated that no one attended. I don't even see how that was pertinent to what I was asking. He seemed to make an argument that if no one attended, then no one has standing to challenge it. That's absurd. It's ludicrous. So if someone was on vacation for two weeks or had a medical condition, death in the family, or overseas on military duty, they would ha not have standing to challenge this, this regulation? doesn't make any sense to me. I don't think that's how it works. I do think it's a problem, though. I think it's a serious problem. And the problem is the statute requires that the notice be published in the paper. That's the minimum requirement, that it's published in the paper. I ask everyone, I ask people on, I'll ask the people on TV, who gets a newspaper anymore? Right? So in, even if you do get the newspaper uh, online, do you go to the legal notices? No, go to the funny pages, right? I don't get a paper. Okay, okay. Just, well. Don't, don't be no. pointing at me. I didn't point. <laughs> I, didn't, I purposely don't point, you're not supposed to. But you see my point, right? So if they follow the minimum requirement and put it in the newspaper, nobody's going to see it. Or if they see it, it, it's just pure happenstance, right? And that's a problem because people need to know what's going on. What the Board of Health can do, or what the Board of Health does and what the Board of Health can do, can severely impact the value of your house. And I think the statute's antiquated. Now we can't change, Sterling can't change the statute. The statute applies to the whole state. But one thing Sterling can do is an enhance the statute with a bylaw. And I know it's not something that you want to hear, but to that end, I am planning on submitting through a citizen petition, if, if necessary, a Warren article for the annual town meeting, which would require the Board of Health to notify every taxpayer through the U.S. mail whenever they hold a hearing to enact a regulation that exceeds Title V. Now, we've already seen that the Board of Health knows how to use the U.S. mail. So I don't think this is unreasonable. If they're going to mail out political letters, then they can mail out notification that might affect their taxes down the road. And people need to understand that the Board of Health has a lot of power. I mean, we haven't seen it in our town until now, really, that people have paid attention to. But there are boards of health that have tried to outlaw selling tobacco in town. That happened in Westminster. The difference with that there is people were notified of the hearing. They went to the hearing, and the Board of Health listened to them and didn't enact the regulation. Here, our Board of Health isn't listening to anyone, and, and they're, they're sticking to it. But well, hopefully the Board of Health moving forward with their newest member will start listening to people. I, I'm doing nothing but listening to people, and I'm trying to, to and do what the people want to do, and this is, this is one way to do it. So just, just to give you a, a, you know, a heads up, this is a draft, I'll bring it up to you, of the 
uh, bylaw that I would like to put forward. With this about notifying people? About the Board of Health re being required to notify people whenever they have a hearing on a regulation that exceeds Title V. Oh my God, he used to love you. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have I'm so busy, forget. forget that. I'm, I'm the one that doesn't do the permanent records. <laughs> yeah. I, I have one. I'll get, I'll get it afterwards, Richard. Um, so I'm not going to read I just I brought it so that you can yeah. look at it. Well, and, and I think, um, you know, it's, it looks like it's prepared, but you almost may be jumping the gun using it as a citizen's petition. If 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 I had to, I would. That's certainly if the, if the select board chooses to put it on the warrant, I'd be thrilled. But we'll give it some thought. Thank you. Sometimes people bring cookies and candy and stuff. But I got some I got some gum in my truck if you want. <laughs> oh my God! No. That's a secret. Huh? That's a secret. Yeah. No. So. That's how I get the senior center bill. They brought cookies to everybody's meetings. Um, and I have researched it. There are other towns that have done similar things. Okay. Not not for the Board of Health, but for other other things. Yeah. And there's ways to do that. Um, if you would, Richard, give me some of your information um, regarding what you would have council address more thoroughly. Sure. Whatever you got, just send it to me or give it to me or I'll send it to you. Or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for me? Any questions, Kristen? Um, gentleman in the front row. <coughs> yeah, he's already oh, spoken yeah. too much tonight, so. Oh, Joe, you? I'm over my quota. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, is there a reason that important issues, and I, I sat here and I listened to Steve Wallace. Uh, and his plans on bringing everything to town meeting. Is there a reason that important initiatives like Board of Health bylaws that may affect property values of everybody in town aren't brought from the communication perspective that you talked about a lot to town meeting? Because I, I, don't, I don't know how this regulation bypassed every communication. That's uh, Oh, you're talking about the new regula the regulation that we're all discussing yeah. as far as how did the Bo Board of Health has every right to do every bylaw. Yes, it would be very nice if people would have had more of a heads up and say this is what's happening. Um, and in this case, it didn't happen. And, and um, how do they get that? They usually get that at town meeting. However, I I, I, Joe, the, the Board, of, Board of Health is an elected board. Mm -hmm. They don't need to do it would be good if they did it, but they don't need to do it. Well, boards of health have legal yep. authority to yep. implement their own regulations. I get it, but... And this but is part of the, the, the response that <laughs> right. council had. It's like, we all knew going in that they have every legal right to do what they did. However, the bigger question is, is it necessary? Is it excessive? Um, you know, that's the bigger question. Why they didn't bring it to a town meeting before they enacted it? Yeah, I, I understand. They have every legal right, but having a legal right doesn't mean that it's the right thing. To do. Absolutely, no question, which is, is why everybody is up in arms, pretty much. It's like, yeah, you can do that. You can do almost anything. Um, you know, I have more power than you could even imagine, which I found out and didn't like, <laughs> you know as a chair of the select board or as a select board member you don't use it hopefully you don't use it you know as you move forward you you would want to in, engage the rest of your board you want to engage the general public your staff whatever you know but that's the right thing to do mm -hmm. not everybody wants to do the right thing yeah, yeah Steve talked a lot about a collaborative discussion right. with town boards yes. and town people about his planning things. Right. I, I think the you know the board of health should be adopting an approach like that. I just I just do. I couldn't agree more. Which is why I'm where I am right now. I think because 
when I sat at that table, I felt the same way. And I did not like boards or entities or people that didn't engage the citizens of Sterling. We're here for the citizens of Sterling. Just because a law says you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. And matter of fact, you can go into some online training for boards of health, and that's one of the things, because the boards of health have a lot of authority. There's some boards of health that have done some very strange things. And, uh, and they've been supported in court because they followed the procedures, you know. Um, and if people ever looked into it, especially people in Sterling, they'd be shocked because it's hard to shock me, but I've, I've seen some cases that I, I can't believe stood up in court, you know, from these boards of health. We need to understand who we're putting in these positions because when you put a, somebody in a position, like Maureen said, and they're not there for the right reasons, or they're there for their own reasons, then that's the wrong reason. And people have to really get to know the people they're voting for and putting in these positions. It's a lot of authority here, and it can be abused. So. I've always been an advocate of, first of all, you don't get into any board or committee for personal reasons or personal endeavors. You just don't. I mean, you look at that thing that's been getting kind of ragged, been up there for a long time. but. I said it was getting ragged. The sign, not you, Richard. But, but, you know, the ability to be fair and open-minded, that, that's a big deal. You don't bring your own stuff to the table. Um, don't have an underlying agenda. And if I could, even if you think that what you're doing is the best thing in the world, and a special town meeting is called and said, we don't, we want you to undo it, you undo it. I mean, it's as plain, that's as plain as day. Yeah. And some people just don't get it. I, I don't get why they don't get it, so. A lot of things we don't get in this life, Richard. Yeah. I'm Thank getting, you. I'm getting out of here. How's that? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Anything else? Anyone? Then, I'd entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. Uh, All those in favor? Thank you.